Coming up on WFT's First at Five, the ongoing battle for Newberry's charter school conversion is coming to a close, what both sides are saying less than a day before results are revealed. And rebuilding an industry, how growers are working to bring back the citrus population that's been wiped out by disease. And Gainesville's most needy neighbors can no longer visit St. Francis House for daily meals. The other services the shelter is continuing to provide. First at Five, from the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Parents and teachers in Newberry have been voting since Friday about converting three charter schools next school year. This is First at Five, I'm Bailey Cornick. And I'm Kirsten Masalka. As the vote finalizes tomorrow, Jared Titel is live in the studio to tell us what the city's major players are predicting. The push for three Newberry public schools to convert to charter schools is coming to a head Wednesday. Newberry Mayor Jordan Marlowe has been vocal in his support for the conversion. Today, he tells us he expects nothing short of a successful vote in favor of the conversion. Mayor Marlowe has been working closely with Education First for Newberry to push the vote forward. The three schools considered for conversion are Newberry Elementary School, Oakview Middle School, and Newberry High School. A vote in favor to convert the schools would mean they would no longer be under the jurisdiction of Alachua County Public Schools. Save Our Schools Newberry is a grassroots organization against the vote, citing the potential of less funding as a danger to students. Over the last few weeks, both sides have been passionate about their stance and confident their side will prevail. I believe that the vote will overwhelmingly be in favor. Uh, it's just a question of whether or not. They would also result in a significantly less funding for the schools through the one mill and that would hurt their electives and many of the uh, activities that are funded by the one mill. So we believe that this would be very harmful for the students and for the entire school district. The vote is based on a 50% plus one basis and involves teachers and students from each of the three schools. After five days of voting, the results will be revealed at the Municipal Building in Newberry tomorrow. The count will take place at 8.30 a.m. and if, if successful, Mayor Marlowe says the process to convert the schools will occur through the next seven months. I will be at tomorrow's count and will bring you the results right here on First Step 5. Reporting live in the studio, Jared Titel, WUFT News. A new law could eliminate charter school conversion fights like the one happening in Newberry right now and make the process much easier. Governor Ron DeSantis signed House Bill 1285 in Jacksonville Monday. The governor says the bill will, quote, eliminate lengthy and drawn out negotiations between the incoming charter school and the school district to ensure no student is trapped at a failing school in Florida. The bill also limits book challenges in Florida for those who do not have children accessing materials in the school district. Under the new law, those without children in schools can only challenge one book each month, while parents with kids in schools can challenge an unlimited number of books. The bill also continues support for the Purple Star Schools of Distinction program, which, military, which aids military families moving to Florida by providing them with support and resources. In the next 90 minutes, the city of McIntosh will have a working government for the first time in months. This comes after four of the five city commissioners resigned over concerns about a financial disclosure form in December. Form 6 requires public officials to report their financial information. City leaders throughout small towns in North Central Florida have expressed their concern over this form because many are not paid for their work. On Friday, Governor DeSantis appointed four members to the board who will be sworn in at a special council meeting tonight. Mayor Marshall Roddy says his priority is moving forward on a quarter of a million dollar plan to replace city pipes that has been on hold. A 13-year-old is behind bars after officers discovered he had a gun near a middle school. On Monday, Gainesville police say officers responded to reports of two people breaking into a home near Abraham Lincoln Middle School. Both suspects attempted to run away from officers, but were both caught quickly. Investigators say one of the suspects was a 13-year-old who was discovered to have a loaded handgun in his waistband. It looks like the heat is here to stay. UF weather forecaster Daniela Rudolph tells us why this weekend might be a great time to head outdoors. That's right, Bailey. We actually have very much above average temperatures coming up, and I'll have your seven-day forecast in just a second. Let's take a look at that beautiful campus cam right now. Those temperatures are feeling like summer at 85 degrees if you're staying with me here in Gainesville this evening. Take a look at that evening planner. Those temperatures are going to be getting a little bit cool, dropping down to 65. But we do have these partly cloudy conditions, which are really going to act as a blanket and help to keep the heat in. Take a look at our lows for across north central Florida, 60 in Palatka, 61 in Ocala. You folks, 59 in Crystal River, just a little bit cooler. 
but it's going to be a lovely evening to head out take the dogs for a walk or the kids to a park and for coming up we do have that summertime feel as Bailey said on the way but with summer comes showers and you want to be allergy aware going into next week a trash collector company employee in Marion County is dead after being struck by a garbage truck tire. An FHP report says the 25-year-old man was working in the Spruce Creek neighborhood when he was hit by the tire. Fire rescue crews say he died at the scene. The incident is still under investigation by fire rescue crews. Florida citrus industry brings about $6.8 billion to the state annually, but citrus production has fallen drastically since the late 90s. WUFT's Natasha Holt is live in the studio to share more about the challenges Florida citrus growers continue to face. 20 years ago, about 900,000 acres of citrus groves covered agricultural lands in Florida. Disease killed off most of those groves. Florida's citrus industry has never been the same. However, growers are seeing some improvements. I spoke with an industry leader who told me why they're optimistic for the future of what they call Florida's signature crop. In the late 90s, Florida citrus was booming, supplying more than 300 million boxes of fruit each year. But in the early 2000s, a disease known as citrus greening plagued fields and decimated about 90% of the state's groves. Worldwide, the, the toughest disease to ever impact the citrus industry and, and honestly in other countries where they've had it for upwards of 100 years, they've really found no solutions to greening. For the past two decades, citrus growers have been fighting this disease to reclaim their industry. Florida Citrus Mutual CEO Matt Joyner says some innovations are helping growers combat this destructive disease. The tools make farmers optimistic. The trees are starting to respond to these treatments. Uh, the bloom this year was one of the most consistent, even blooms we've had in a long time. You're seeing a lot of new growth in these trees and some vigor that, that gives us hope. Many of the groves that were lost have since been converted to other crops or for houses. But there's hope to replant groves that were killed off. And don't write our obituary. We're, we're making a comeback. We have the tools in place uh, to move this industry forward. We have growers that are committed to do just that. In order to continue to provide Florida's gold to the nation. Last month, the Florida legislature approved a budget that would supply more than $47 million to support Florida citrus research for treatments and programs that aim to reignite the industry. Live in the studio, Natasha Holt, WUFT News. A Gainesville homeless shelter is no longer providing free meals to its visitors. Yesterday was the final day St. Francis House served meals to the hungry and homeless. St. Francis House leaders say the decision comes after rising cost, including a 30% increase in operational expenses. The organization will continue its emergency shelter and offer meals for vulnerable women and families. But another Gainesville nonprofit continues to serve meals every day. With support from county and city funding, Grace Marketplace Dining Hall, Cafe 131, serves about 400 meals per day. During the week, Cafe 131 serves three meals during breakfast, lunch, and dinner hours. You can see the times the cafe is open on your screen now. On the weekends, visitors can come by for brunch from 1030 to 1130 in the morning and dinner from 430 to 530 in the evening. In less than an hour, Alachua County School Board officials will vote to decide whether or not to keep some schools in session year round. If approved, Metcalf and Rawlings Elementary Schools will shift to an 11-month year-round school calendar starting July 16th. This is part of a four-year pro pilot program approved by Governor Ron DeSantis in February. Board members are meeting at 6 p.m. at the ACPS di district office to vote. P.K. Young is also participating in the pilot program, but school leaders say the changes won't start until the 2025 school year. A new exhibit in Gainesville is honoring veterans who have served the country. How its creator was inspired by personal experiences when first at five returns. You're watching WUFT TV News. The Matheson Museum in Gainesville is honoring those who have served our country with the display designed by a veteran. WUFT's Grace Dunn joins us now live at the exhibit with how the art is impacting our local veterans. This outdoor exhibit showcases a collection of artwork focused on honoring veterans. It's situated on the west side of the main Matheson building, behind a set of flagpoles along Sweetwater Branch. The outdoor exhibit at the Matheson History Museum has been a source of healing for many, especially the designer Ken McGurn. McGurn was deployed to Vietnam in 1965 and Germany from 1968 to 1970. I joined when I was 17 and went on active duty when I was 18. I was in Vietnam when I was 19. 
The piece is titled, When Johnny Came Marching Home, Some Gave All, All Gave Some. It commemorates those who came home from war with both physical challenges and mental wounds. This exhibit, in memory of the folks who've come back, some have physical problems like here. This one's designed so it's, uh, it's uh, missing a leg. Others come back with, uh, with psychological problems. Matthew Pollard built the pieces and intentionally chose the materials to represent strength. You know, I sort of finalized it in the materials uh, using rebar and expanded steel. Um, and we sort of worked with each other to find a, a, a happy medium between the construction and the uh, concept. Pollard says he loves the piece because it's about remembering sacrifices and bravery. According to the museum's website, its mission is to preserve and interpret the history of Gainesville, Alachua County, and surrounding regions. Live in Gainesville, Grace Dunn, WUFT News. Archer City officials are paving the way for expansion on Archer Road. At a joint meeting between Archer and Alachua County Commissioners, they discussed plans to expand the state-owned two-lane road. The project would add two lanes between the intersections of Tower and Parker Roads. Construction takes place over the course of five years and costs more than $18.3 million. Because it is a state-owned road, state officials have agreed to fund the project. A new program will have Ocala neighbors hitting the gym with the mayor. The free event will be held on the first Saturday of the month through October in different locations throughout Ocala. The program will kick off on May 4th at 9 a.m. at the Mary Sue Rich Community Center. Attendees can meet Mayor Ben Marciano, join fitness classes, learn about different machines, and enter giveaways. Former San Diego Chargers Safety and Ocala gym owner Clint Hart will join the mayor at the first event. An Alachua County teacher is being recognized at the national level for her educational impact. Rawlings Elementary School teacher Cynthia Tunnell is a finalist for the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. Tunnell is one of six finalists from Florida. If she wins, she'll receive an all-expenses-paid trip to a recognition ceremony, $10,000 from the National Science Foundation, and a certificate signed by the President of the United States. The date for announcing the winner has not yet been announced. Right now, the radar is clear despite tonight's cloud coverage, but we can have some storms on the way. That's right, Natasha. We do have a spot shower over the panhandle tomorrow morning. However, later on in the week, we'll be seeing some storms in North Central Florida. I'll have more on the other side of the break. You're watching WUFT TV News. Right now we have beautiful conditions at 86 degrees. Take a look at our Crystal River Cam. We do have a little bit of clouds, but they're not going to be producing any rain for us here in North Central Florida. This evening is going to be a lovely evening to head out. Take a look at that hour by hour for the remainder of our evening. Starting out around 87 degrees, but a big drop, about 20 degrees down to that 3 a.m. hour. So going to be a little chilly when we do wake up in the morning. Definitely want to take a jacket when you're headed out the door because we have a 62 degree cool start to our day. Those partly cloudy conditions are going to stay with us for the rest of the day. And those temperatures are peaking around 80 so even though we do have some cloud coverage, feeling like summer. Another thing that comes with summer, unfortunately, is the muggy meter. If you're like me, not a big fan of the heat, you're really not in for a treat this week. Take a look at the dew point. That just explains how it's going to feel on our skin peaking at 58 degrees so we're really sitting in that muggy range however it's going to be a lovely weekend as that dew point really starts to drop toward sunday take a look at those high temperatures across north central florida tomorrow here in gainesville 88 palatka at 89 you folks in crystal river 87 and cedar key just a little bit cooler just below those 80s but across the board we're sitting in those mid 80s except you folks in ocala almost peaking at 90 degrees so it's really starting to get that summertime feel and unfortunately with summer really comes those showers and comes pollen. So if you do have allergies, you definitely want to take a mask headed out for the remainder of your week. We have some grass and tree that's going to be really high. And then going toward our weekend, we have some ragweed, which is also going to agitate those allergies if you do suffer from them. But it's going to be a beautiful weekend to head out. Saturday, we're peaking at 91 degrees. We definitely do have that summertime feel on the way. And then for our Sunday, just a little bit cooler at 88. But unfortunately, that's not going to stay with us for much longer as we do have some showers on the way. We can see the panhandle. You folks are getting it around that 2 p.m. hour on Sunday, and it's going to be making its way toward us as we see a cold front approaching us and is going to drop those temperatures down. So not really feeling like summer for very much longer, but still will be a little bit warm as we do in Florida. 
can see here around that 9 a.m. hour on Monday morning. This yellow dot is storms that are going to be just a little bit on the heavy side. So if you live in this area surrounding Gainesville toward the Tampa and Orlando area, you definitely want to take an umbrella. If you're headed out the door, take a look at that seven day outlook. Now we actually have those temperatures that are going to be quite high above our normal temperature range. You can see our lows are 55 and our highs are 81 in the normal range. However, take a look at Saturday folks peaking at 92 degrees, about 11 degrees above average. So it's going to be a really, really warm week. But we do see those storms on Monday as that cold front again approaches us. We can see those temperatures dropping about 9 degrees from Sunday to Tuesday, but it's still going to be a lovely Florida week. Gator baseball is back in action tonight as the team tries to redeem itself following a series loss against South Carolina over the weekend. WUFT's Jack Meyer is at the ballpark to give us more insight as to how the team is switching gears heading into tonight. All that and more after the break. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome back to sports. I'm Reagan Shepard. Gator baseball has been up and down all season, but things really took a downhill turn after the series lost to Mizzou less than two weeks ago. The team takes a diamond again tonight against Jacksonville University, and WUFT's Jack Meyer is live at the ballpark to tell us more about the team's plans moving forward. Thanks, Reagan. This season has gone anything but according to plan for the Florida Gators. In the last two weeks, Florida has plummeted from being ranked sixth in the country to falling out of the top 25 entirely. The month of April has not been a kind one to this Gator squad. After being swept by the previously last place Missouri Tigers, Florida gave up 19 runs in a mercy rule defeat at the hands of the number 10 Florida State Seminoles last Tuesday. The loss marked the first time FSU has swept UF in their annual three game season series since 2000. Now, even with all that being said, hope still remains for this Gator squad to return to its championship form. Despite a series loss to the South Carolina Gamecocks this past weekend, Florida blasted out three home runs on Sunday afternoon to snap their six game losing skid entering tonight's matchup with Jacksonville. In the first meeting between these two squads last month, Jacksonville came away with a 7-6 victory. Florida will look to get its revenge tonight. Redshirt freshman Jake Clemente is expected to take, to take to the mound for the Gators tonight with first pitch set for 6.30 p.m. Reporting live from Conjuring Ballpark, Jack Meyer, WUFT News. Moving on to the tennis courts, the Florida's men's team earned its ticket to the SEC Championships. The tournament starts tomorrow and concludes with the championship match on Sunday. The seventh seed Gators take the court on Thursday afternoon against 10 seed Vanderbilt. The winner of this match will go on to play the second seed Tennessee Volunteers in the quarterfinal round on Friday. The Gators claimed the regular season conference title in three of the last four seasons and won the SEC tournament in 2022. This weekend is an opportunity for the Gators to reclaim its spot as an SEC title contender. Again, the tournament starts tomorrow in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Staying on the championship wave, the Gators gymnastics team begins its NCAA run in Fort Worth, Texas on Thursday. The number four Gators will compete at 9 p.m. Eastern in session two of the semifinal round. They will take the floor against number one Oklahoma, number five Utah, and number six Alabama. WUFT will be providing live coverage throughout the competition throughout the weekend starting tomorrow. The top two teams from each semifinal will go on to compete in the national championship, which takes place on Saturday, April 20th at 4 p.m. And one more exciting note before we go, Florida's own Leilani Career was selected as the 27th pick in the third round of the WNBA draft. She will join Caitlin Clark in the Indiana Fever for the upcoming season. That's all I have for sports. I'm Reagan Shepard. Women's basketball is having such a moment right now. I'm mm -hmm. living for the fashion. It's so awesome. They're really out there cooking like hot. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I see. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Well, Ocala's very own Master Chef Junior is one of the final six cooks remaining on the popular competition show. Michael Seagobin made it through last night's elimination. We told you Monday he is a son of a Marion County Fire Rescue Lieutenant. This is a video of Michael preparing a surf and turf lunch for the crew at the Waresdale Fire Station. You can cheer young Michael on each Monday night at 8 on Fox. Before we go, one last check on the weather. Speaking of things heating up in the kitchen, things are also heating up here in North Central Florida. We really do have those warm temperatures on the way, peaking at and 92 degrees on Saturday, but a cold front is going to be moving its way toward us on Monday, dropping down those temperatures. Thanks for joining us. We're back here tomorrow for another edition of First at Five. But your North Central Florida news is always on WFT.org and on all of our social media platforms. Have a good night.